Hey, uh, that's all the announcements. I'm going to yapper for a little bit here, but I do want to tell you, Pastor Mark is gone, and it's always incredible when Pastor Mark is gone uh, that things, and th- th- things seem to go really smooth. And we're going to see if Pastor Chris can keep it up and keep things running smooth. Would you guys please welcome one of my best friends, Pastor Chris. Good morning, King's House. You guys doing all right this morning? It's so cold outside. My gosh, this summer heat's killing me. Speaking of summer, a lot of people will always say like, oh, for the church, you know, it's summertime. You guys are going to slow down, right? And <laughs> No. No, no, we don't, because we got youth camp, summer camp, internship program, summer outreach and stuff. It's busy. And how many guys would agree that when life gets busy, life can get a little hard sometimes? Come on, raise that hand. It's all right. Life can be hard. Pastor Mark sent a text message to us staff pastors a few weeks ago, and it's this one right here. And you might have seen this meme on social media, but it says, adulthood is saying, but after this week, things will slow down a bit over and over until you die. Any witnesses in the house this morning? That actually wasn't the real picture he sent us. He, he screenshot that one, and then he edited it and sent it to us. And this is what he said. Working at King's house is saying, but after this week, things will slow down a bit over and over until you die. And it's true. We are constantly going, and we are constantly doing. Uh, I'm always amazed of the size of our church and the size of the events and the people that we reach. It's just incredible. But it's safe to say that no matter what stage of life we're in, from kids to adulthood, life can be hard. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. My son, he's four, he's going on 17, okay? <laughs> if you know Colin, he's four, he's going on 17. And he has chores. And the chores that he has is that he needs to make sure the dog is watered and got some food. And if you got clean clothes, you got to put those clean clothes up, fold them, hang them up, help Sissy do the dishes. And I'm not kidding you, his reaction every time. Hey, Bubba, we can play video games after we do this. Hey, we can go swimming after this. Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. And I'm like, Bubba, you have no idea what hard is. And then you go into elementary school. Any elementary kids in the house right now? Come on over here. It's hard, right? You guys are in school for eight hours a day. Why do they send you home with homework to do more schoolwork at home? Life is hard. I don't get it. And then you enter into teenagehood. Yeah, body starts changing. Yeah, enough said. Insecurities at our all-time high, right? Life is hard. And then you have adulting. Someone say adulting. And adulting comes with getting a job to pay your bills, to pay your taxes, to do the cooking, the cleaning, the parenting, the spousing, the leaning, the counseling, like all this stuff. It's okay to say that life is hard sometimes. And this morning, I'm here to just encourage you if you're going through a rough time this morning, because even if you're going through something hard right now, you might even say, PC, it's not something that I'm going through hard right now. Life isn't hard for me. Life seems impossible right now. I don't even know how I'm going to get through it. And that's actually the title of my message this morning. If you're taking notes, it's getting through your it. Shh. See what I did there? See what I did there? <laughs> Light bulb moment. Getting through your it. Now, if you were with us for our marriage conference back in February, raise your hand, say, that was me. Some of you guys have heard this message before. I typically don't repeat a message, but I really felt God was saying, hey, this one's worth repeating. So getting through your it. I might not know everybody here personally one-on-one, but there is something I do know about you, and that is one of three things. Either one, you're coming out of your it. Two, you're either in your it, or three, You're gonna go through some it. Welcome to the King's house. I'm glad you're here this morning. It's the reality of life. Life is hard sometimes. But listen, this morning I wanna encourage you, don't get hung up on the it part of the title of the message because the key word in the title of the message is the word through. Someone say through. Okay, say it again. Good, because as a kid's pastor, I talk faster. We'll get through this lesson a whole lot faster if you talk back to me, okay? So I'm gonna camp out this morning in Isaiah chapter 43. So if you got your Bibles or you got your Bible app, you can turn to it. If not, we'll have it on the screen for you. But anytime you see that word through, I want you to say it back to me. Are you ready? Isaiah chapter 43, verse two says this. When you pass, you guys are so good. Let's do it again. When you pass the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass... The rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk 
The fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Listen, I don't know what kind of it you might be facing today. I don't know what you're going through. It may be a business situation. It may be a financial situation. Maybe it's a marriage situation, a health situation. But you need to know number one thing right here. The question you gotta ask yourself for the rest of our time this morning is this question. What is my it? What is it that causes you to sometimes question your faith? What is it that you are constantly going through that causes you such stress and anxiety and anger, maybe depression? What is it? And if you're like me, you don't have to think very long to rattle off what that number one it is. Am I right? Maybe you can rattle off a few it's in your life. But listen, I wish that this whole passage said um, that if you walk through the fires and if you walk through the waters, but it doesn't say that. What does it say? It says when. We are going to face trials and troubles. That's exactly what the Bible talks about. So really quick, I wanna talk about water. I love drinking water. I think I'm the only one on staff that really just drinks water as water. Every other guy on staff doesn't like the taste of water. They kind of mix it in with some flavoring stuff every now and then. But water is powerful. It's overwhelming. It can sweep away something as solid as an entire structure off of its foundation. It's something that's essential to give us life, and yet it can quickly take away life. Um, It's said that it takes about three to five inches of water to move a vehicle, just to move a vehicle. And it says that it takes less than that to actually drown in. So really quick, think about this with me. If you're in your car and you're going on vacation, you're on the highway, but there's a lake or a river in front of you, your highway turns into a what to go over the Thank you, a bridge. So getting ready for this message, and I know it depends on what Bible translation you're using, but I could not find the word bridge in the Bible anywhere. I couldn't. Maybe it's in there somewhere, but I couldn't find the word bridge. And maybe, maybe there's just some things that God doesn't want you to avoid. Maybe there's some things God wants you to go through. Just think about that for a minute. Maybe there's some things that God wants you to go through. It kind of reminds me of a song that I used to hear growing up called Going on a Bear Hunt. Does anyone remember that song? I'm going on a bear hunt, I got my binoculars, I got my backpack, I got my rifle. Oh, a swamp. Man, I can't go over it, I can't go under it, I can't go around it, it looks like I ought to go through it. Oh man, look, a cave. I can't go over it, can't go under it, can't go around it, it looks like I've gotta go through it. Maybe there are some things in our life where God just intends you to go through instead of avoiding. And then there's fire, because don't you think it interesting in that scripture of Isaiah chapter 43, when describing our it to us, that God in the scripture uses two powerful elements of fire and water, which are commonly um, agreed upon two of the worst ways to die, drowning and burning. And fire is all consuming. It knows no bounds. It will burn everything within its path, leaving only ashes of what once was. And the Bible verse says this. It says that when you walk through the fires, everything will be magically extinguished and you'll be just fine. (laughs) I wish, right? I wish. But it doesn't say that. It says when you walk through the fires, dot, 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 what? I will be with you. It's a promise from God. And if you are familiar with scripture, you can remember back of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who literally were standing in fire, physical fire. And God's presence was physically with them to where the king's double blinking and be like, I thought we threw three people in there. I see four. And their fire was actually turned up seven times hotter. So this morning, I'm just here to encourage you that no matter how deep the waters may be right now, no matter how hot the fire may be that you're walking through right now, you're gonna get through it because God is always with you. Someone say amen to that. Now the question you gotta ask yourself this morning before we go on, because I got three core truths that I'm gonna pull out of scripture for us this morning. The question we gotta ask ourselves is, is yes, if, you're, if everything is sunshine and rainbows right now for you, man, I'm so happy for you, but you're gonna go through some it in the future. It's inevitable. We're gonna go through it. Maybe you're knee deep in it right now. I don't know. But listen, the question is that the next time you are faced with your it, the question you gotta ask yourself is how am I gonna get through it? How am I gonna get through this? And so the the three core truths I'm gonna pull out of scripture, we're gonna start with Isaiah chapter 43 again, but instead of verse two, we're gonna jump to verse 16. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, there's that word again, 
a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished and snuffed out like a wick. The first truth, if you're taking notes this morning, is this, is that God challenges us to look through our it, to flip through our it. Because right here in this scripture of Isaiah, we're flipping back in time to the story where the children of Israel are crossing the Red Sea. You guys familiar with that story? God split the Red Sea in half. The children of Israel are crossing over on dry ground and right behind them come the enemy, the Egyptians, trying to capture them again, put them back in slavery. But as soon as the children of Israel got safe to the other side, what happened? God collapsed the sea and snuffed out the enemy. Underline this part, if you've got a Bible or if you're taking notes, underline that part where it says, he who made a way. He who made a way. I love that part. It's because if we really do serve the God of the Bible who says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then that means that he was a way maker. Come on. He is a way maker. And what? He's always going to be a way maker. And flipping through your it kind of reminds me of flipping through some old photo albums. Sometimes my wife and I, and this happens not very often, but occasionally we'll sit down and we'll flip through some scrapbooks. Um, Going down memory lane of dating times, and I'm telling you, life before kids seems like a different lifetime ago. Am I right, parents? Because we're flipping through some of these pictures and sometimes on our phones, like a pop-up of like, hey, this happened 12 years ago. Hey, this happened 15 years ago. And we're like, oh my God, I remember that place. That was amazing. Oh, look at our first house. Oh my God, look at what we were wearing. What were we thinking? You know, it's kind of like that. And, and it's going through those memories, the good and the bad and everything in between. I'm, I'm reminded of how much I'm blessed to have this girl and call her my wife because with Without her, I would not be who I am today. And it's just like that flipping. God is inviting you relationally to flip through your past with him of other times when you were in your it and how he brought you through it because of his goodness and faithfulness. I can tell you so many stories personally because since I was a teenager, I have kept prayer journals after prayer journals. Melody's kept prayer journals since she was probably two years old. Her nightstand is covered with them. When she asked me to move her nightstand one day, I was like, good Lord. I open it up, it's filled with prayer journals. She can flip through so many instances of her life and I can flip through so many instances of my life where we were going through some stuff growing up. And then it's even more fun to flip forward to see when and how God answered those prayers for us. It's amazing to flip through it. And I'm pretty sure you can also tell me some stories that you guys have as well. But here's the thing, the reason why we need to flip through our is because we have to remember God's goodness and faithfulness. Jesus even did this himself, sitting down with his disciples right before he was going off to the Garden of Gethsemane. They're sitting down for the Last Supper and and they're taking communion together. And Jesus said, take this wine, take this bread, do this in remembrance of me. He gets uh, arrested, he's crucified, he's buried, he's resurrected, he's about to go into heaven and he even says, someone better is coming than me. I gotta go, but someone's coming who's better than me. And this is Jesus's words in John 14, 26. But the advocate, he said, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and what? Remind you of everything I have said to you. Why would Jesus feel the need to tell us that you need the Holy Spirit to be reminded of everything I've taught you? Probably because he knew that his humans were tend to forget a bunch of things, right? <laughs> How many of you guys have forgotten really important things like when your wedding anniversary is? Don't raise your hand on that when you're about to get slapped. Listen, what about your, your kids' birthdays? People are asking you when you're signing them up for stuff like kids' camp and stuff, like, hey, when was your kid born? Uh, like we tend to forget the most important things like where did I leave my car keys? Show of hands, did anyone ever lose your car keys and put them in something like the refrigerator before that you've seen? Oh, thank you. I did it one time myself too. I have no clue what was happening. I could not find my car keys, but we forget some really, really important things, but yet we, we, uh, we remember the most dumbest things. If we forget important things, like did we turn the stove off before we left for vacation? Did you feed the dog? Did we leave Kevin at home alone again? Some of y'all got that one, okay? We forget really important things, but we, 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 we remember the most dumbest things. I'll prove it to you. I need your help on this one though. I don't sing very good, so I'm gonna sing a little part of a song. You gotta sing it back to me even if you suck too, okay? Ready? Ba-da-ba-ba-ba, um, McDonald's. And some of y'all don't even like McDonald's and you remember that, okay? One more, one more. See if you guys can remember this one. <clears throat> In West Philadelphia, I was born and raised. 
We remember that. But sometimes we forget God's goodness and faithfulness. And here's the point to that whole silly scenario. If we're not careful, King's House, we will allow our it to forget God's goodness and faithfulness. That's really good. You need to write that down probably. If we're not careful, (laughs) we're gonna allow our it to forget God's goodness and his faithfulness. So how do you flip through it? Listen, Jonah and the whale or Jonah and the fish, it depends on which Veggie Tales episode you're watching that day with your kids, okay? But he was three days in the belly of this beast and he's literally sitting in it. And in that moment in Jonah chapter two, verse seven, this is what Jonah said. As my life was slipping away. Come on, how many of you guys feel like when you go through your it, you're like, this is it, game over for me. I'm I'm done. This is it. My life is over. I can't do it anymore. He said, as my life was slipping away, I what? Remembered the Lord and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. What happened to Jonah in that moment? He flipped through it. He reminded himself, and listen, I know by experience, I know it is not easy to think back of your own past when you're in the middle of it, to think back through your past of how God brought you through other scenarios and other situations. I know it's not easy to do that. So here's a tip. If you're struggling to think back of God's goodness and faithfulness in your own life, because let's face it, when we're going through it, we think the grass is always greener on everybody else's side, then flip through scripture. Flip back through other stories, true history accounts of the Bible of people just like you and me who were going through it and how God brought them through it. Let that encourage you this morning as you think about that. And let's jump to Isaiah chapter 43. We're in there, but let's jump to verse 18 really quick. So we're still in Isaiah 43. This is verse 18, and this is what it says. Forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. We gotta take a time out real quick. (laughs) because we just got done talking about how God told us to remember everything. And now he's telling us to forget everything. Is God bipolar? What's going on? So let's continue to read Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. This is why, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? So here's the second truth this morning. If the first truth of getting through our aid is God's challenging you to flip through it, The second truth is that God is challenging you to look through it. Someone say, look through it. That means, do you have the courage, do you have the ability that while you're standing in your it, that you can look through your current situation into the future of what God has promised you that lies ahead of you? Think back with me. We're going to flip through just in our our current situations and even in the Bible. But when you flip through your past and you remember God's goodness and faithfulness, it helps you look through your present situation. And it helps you look forward to what God has for you. Because flip back with me just in your own mind, David looked past and looked through a giant named Goliath, didn't he? Daniel looked through and looked past the mouths of hungry lions that were literally staring him out in the face, okay? And then Joshua, there's so many, but Joshua looked through and looked past this impenetrable wall of Jericho. Why? What's, so, what's the common thing here is that they all knew that past this current situation I'm facing, God has a promise for me that lies ahead. And my most favorite part, and I'm not going to read it to you, but I'm going to sum it up. My most favorite story is found in 2 Kings chapter 6 from the prophet Elisha. And the prophet Elijah and his servant are surrounded by the enemy. So think with me in your mind. They're in a little valley area. And up on the little hills surrounding them are their enemy. Swords, spears, shields. And the Bible says that Elisha's servant is freaking out. We're gonna die! Ah! And Elisha prayed to God. Now, the funny thing about this is that Elisha didn't pray saying, God, would you please deliver us from our enemy? God, will you please give us victory in this battle because it's the dynamic duo against everybody else? God, would you? No. Elisha prayed to God and said, God, would you please open up my servant's eyes to see what I see? And in that moment, even though the servant could literally see the enemy surrounding him, the Bible says that God opened up the servant's eyes and past the enemy was God's army surrounding the enemy, chariots of fire that were surrounding it. I love that true story in the Bible because it reminds me that even when we're faced with our it and we're surrounded by our enemy, God surrounds our enemy and he fights our battles for us. Amen, King's House? It is amazing. And I think that's what the psalmist, David, 
said when he wrote Psalm 23. We know this one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But in Psalm 23, 4, it says, even though I walk through, there's that word again. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Even Jesus himself looked through his it. When he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he's praying the night before he's betrayed, he's telling God, I don't wanna go through with this. If there's any other way to save humankind, please. And then he catches himself and he says, not my will be done, but your will be done. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, it shows us how and why he looked through his it. It says that for the joy set before him, he endured it. He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It was the joy that was set before him. He endured it. He looked through it. Some translations of the Bible in this verse in Isaiah that says, do you not see it? Do you not, do you not perceive what I'm doing? Some versions use the word behold. And the Hebrew word from that verse, behold, I had to look this up, make it sound like I know what I'm talking about. It's pronounced chazah. You gotta put some phlegm in it. So everyone go chazah. Sounds like a little magic thing, chazah. But this, this Hebrew word for behold actually carries a really heavy meaning for us this morning. And that meaning is this, to perceive with inner vision, to prophesy over your life, to see beyond your natural eyes. And I believe that God has you here this morning to remind you that again, no matter how hot that fire may seem, baby, no matter how deep that water may seem, he's with you and you're gonna get through it. The last part of Isaiah 43, verse 19, says this, I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I want you to highlight or underline or write that phrase, I am making a way. I love that part, and this is why. Quick recap before I give you the third truth. The first one to get through our it is that we've gotta flip through it. The second truth, you gotta look through it. And here's the third one is that God is challenging you to believe that he's really gonna get you through it. He's gonna get you through it. Now that phrase, I am making a way, takes all the pressure off of you and me this morning. Isn't that liberating? (laughs) There's nothing you or I can do to get through our it. It's everything that Christ has done is continuing to do in our lives. He is making a way. There's a... um, There's a song we sometimes sing here at church from Elevation Church called uh, Graves into Gardens. Anybody love that song? Listen, the bridge of that song is what really gets me. These are the words. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame to glory because you're the only one who can. It goes on to say that you turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways because you're the only one who can. And all of these beautiful images that are painted in your mind's eye as you hear this song or as you read the lyrics on the screen, they're not just fancy pantsy words. These are flipping through true accounts in the Bible of history where God was with some people who were going through their it and he brought them through it. And the key word in this last part of Isaiah 43, 19 is the word making. Someone say making. It's a process. Let me give you a quick example. My son loves to eat, loves to eat. He's our human garbage disposal at home, okay? And if you do serve with him in Kidopolis, you know that he'll eat his weight in goldfish if you let him and then some. So we're invited to a local pastor's house not too long ago for dinner. And our kids are playing with their kids and we're having a great time. And dinner's kind of backed up just a little bit, which is okay, but Colin's hungry. So of course, Colin's hungry. He's never hungry. Not hung- anyway, he comes to me and he says, Daddy, I'm so hungry. When is dinner gonna be ready? Shh, Bubba. <laughs> They're working on it. It's okay. Go play. He goes, play. Three minutes later. Daddy, I'm hungry. When is dinner gonna be ready? Bubba. <laughs> They're in the kitchen, they're making it, it's okay. Because Colin is used to the quick, 
I need a PBJ sandwich right now. Fill her up, Dad. Or uh, ramen noodles, if we've got it. You can't go wrong with ramen noodles. Pop those suckers in the microwave. Or a cheese stick. Melody does a great job of feeding us some healthy food, but when Mama's not home, sometimes we just pop a pizza in the oven, okay? Just saying. And sometimes when we're out and about, we got to get some fast food, some Taco Bell, some whatever it takes to just get some food in our tummies. And Colin is sometimes used to that because he goes to school, he's got a sack lunch. He don't have to make it. He unzips it, it's there. So he's like, Daddy, I'm hungry. When is food going to be ready? So I'm like, bub, come here. So we go, to a, we, we go to a separate room really quick and I sit down with him and he's hangry at this point. So I'm trying to calm my four-year-old down. I'm like, bub, I promise you, they're making the food. It's going to be okay. I'm hungry, daddy. I know you're hungry. But bubba, this food's a little bit different than what I sometimes make you. Like, they're actually cooking this food, okay? <laughs> and it, it, it's going to take a moment, but I promise it's going to be worth the wait. I wish I could say that we had an awesome father-son bonding moment then, but we didn't. Uh, He went back and played and we ate soon after that. But as corny as this example may seem, guys, whatever you're walking through right now, I know you want your it to be over with right now. But God is in the process of making something amazing for you. You just gotta wait for it. And I know that you want it to be through right now. But maybe... The reason why you're not through your it right now is because God's not through with you. Because when we walk through the fire, that's when we're refined. That's when we're, we're purged. That's when we're tested. When we walk through the waters, that's when we're purified. That's when we're cleansed. It's kind of those moments where God is just knocking at the door of your heart saying, how much do you trust me? How much do you trust me? And before I close out, I'm just going to be completely vulnerable to you guys this morning. If, you, if you've heard me speak at any other time other than Kid Nation, um, you'll know that I'm always gonna be transparent with you guys. I will never pretend to be a pastor who has it all together. As a matter of fact, I really hate and dislike pastors who put on a church face and pretend that their life is perfect. Because what people need to remember is that people are not perfect, okay? Sorry. But also, pastors are people too, which means pastors are not perfect. Perfect. So if you ever meet a perfect pastor, run! Because it's all smoke and mirrors, okay? They're gonna suck you into the great void. So I'm gonna be completely transparent with you this morning and just share with you a quick um, recent it that I walked through. Um, Four weeks ago, I'm sitting on the back porch with my wife and I am in tears. I am sobbing. I know I'm turning in my man card to a lot of you fellas, but I'm not trying to impress you, so it's okay. So I'm in tears and I'm just crying to my wife. And my wife's like, what is wrong with you? Like, I don't know. I'm exhausted. My mind is exhausted. My body's exhausted. My faith is depleted. Church is the next morning. I don't want to go to church. I don't have anything more to give. I don't know what's wrong. And she's like, but let, let's talk about this a little bit. So over the course of what felt like an eternity to me, well, it was probably more like five minutes. We started to talk through like, this wasn't just a today thing. And the thing about that day is that I got to sleep in that day. I took a two hour nap when my kids took a nap. I intentionally didn't do any work around the house or work for the church. Like I took the day off and I still felt freaking exhausted. And my wife saw like, this isn't just happening today. You've been in this funk for like a few weeks now. You know that, right? I'm like, yes! I started to turn into this tyrant. Like I'm yelling at my kids at the drop of a pin and and I'm yelling at my wife and I'm just this ungrateful person. I'm not happy. And when we have hangouts, people are like, what the heck is wrong with Chris? Like nothing made me happy. I was so freaking tired and I was just tired of life in general. I'm even looking at my wife and I'm saying, I just wish there was like a happy magic peel I could take and everything would just be gone. And she's like, well, have you prayed about it? Yes, I prayed about it. I fasted about it. Prayer doesn't work. <sighs> one, of, one of my pastors just said, prayers don't work. Don't be, don't be like you never said anything like that before. Come on. Pastors are people too. I've had a relationship with God since I was eight years old. So as soon as that came out of my mouth, I knew that was not true. <laughs> and when I said prayer doesn't work, it was kind of like God was upstairs going, oh yeah, watch this. So later that night, after we got done talking, and and we realized that for me personally, these feelings of exhaustion and, if you will, depression um, came in waves for me. Melody and I would think back like, man, this has been going on for 11, 12 years since we've been married. It's your fault. That's what it is, Melody. I just figured that out. That's as long as we've been married. (laughs) 
I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She, she just talked back with me about how far she could remember, remember being with me. She's like, babe, I've noticed this about you forever. Like every three or four months, you just, you just get hit with this wave of like a depression to where you are just ungrateful, you're unhappy, you're, you're angry. You, the kids are miserable around you. I'm miserable around you. Like I've noticed this trend. Of course, that's making me feel like all awesome and goosey bumps and good. I'm just upset now. But later that night, I went to God once again in prayer and I said, God, I know you're here, but I don't know where you are right now. And I don't know what to do. I'm exhausted. So in that moment, I decided I was gonna turn my desperation into a determination. And I said, God, I'm gonna fast and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna believe that you're gonna get me through this, whatever this it is. Guys, I hate fasting. I love eating, okay? So for a week, I'm fasting, I'm praying, and I had to make myself get up at like 5, 5.30 or 6. You heard me. I had to make myself pray. And sometimes my prayers were like little, thank you, God, for today. And I would just sit in silence or I would play some worship music. Sometimes my prayers would be in the form of writing down my prayers in my prayer journal. And sometimes I'd be just pacing back and forth at my back porch, just pacing and praying and prophesying and proclaiming freedom and victory over my life from whatever it is. I was naming insecurities. I was naming depression. I was naming any type of thing that was coming against me, uh, unhappiness, my joy being stolen, whatever it was. Like I'm praying against anything that's coming against me because I also know that it was also a spiritual attack. So a week and a half, two weeks go by, and I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit lighter through this, a little bit more free from it. And, and I know that when you're in your it, it's really hard for you to just pull open Spotify and play a song that's going to encourage you that morning, because that's probably the last thing we think about. And so this morning, I'm going to put it on the screen for you, but during this, uh, going through this it recently, I made a Spotify playlist for myself, and I called it Victory. And all of these songs within this playlist are songs solely dedicated around finding freedom in your life, victory in your life. And this is how you can find it. Um, if you need to, me or Blake can show you how to get to it if you've got Spotify, because I wanna encourage you, if you or a friend is going through it, man, this is an awesome playlist that you can just play and just hear song after song after song about you gaining victory from your it. And I wish I could tell you this morning that after all of that, everything's great. I'm never gonna have to walk through that it again. But that's not reality, is it, King's House? Because life is hard. And there just comes a time where you have to come to a, a stance with God and say, I'm taking my desperation and I'm gonna turn it into determination. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to grab a hold of your hand, Lord, and you lead me through this it. I'm gonna ask the prayer team to come up really quick. Um, and I'm gonna dismiss here in just a few minutes, but as they come up and, and they're gonna stand up here, if you need prayer and you just need to be vulnerable and open up to somebody this morning about how can I get through my it, listen, I don't know. Maybe you're knee deep in it. Maybe you're neck deep in it. I don't know what your it is. And I know you want it to be over with, but God is not through with you yet. Why pray with somebody? That's really personable, PC. Yeah, I know. But um, it reminds me of a story in the Bible in Exodus where Moses is holding up his staff that God gave him high above a battle on a hill. And down below the battle, the children of Israel are fighting against the enemy called the Amicalites. And the Bible says that as long as Moses held that staff in the air, the children of Israel would win. But when his arms got tired and he would drop his staff, the children of Israel would lose. And Aaron, which is Moses' brother, is down there in the battlefield, and a friend of his named Hur, H-U-R, could see the pattern that was going on. They'd look up, they'd look down, they'd see, oh my God, this God is with Moses. We need to go to Moses. So they hustle up to the mountain. They sit Moses down on a rock. Aaron gets on one side, Hur gets on the other, and they hold up the staff of God above the battlefield until victory was won. Three little truths we can take out of this before we leave this morning. Number one, God needs to be held high above every battle that you face, period. Number two, sometimes you just need an Aaron and a Hur to come alongside of you and help hold your arms up until victory is won. And number three, sometimes you need to be an Aaron or a Hur to somebody else because we all face it. We all are going through it. So this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, this is just what I wanna ask of you. Just 
brutal honesty between you and God. This isn't my business. This isn't the person sitting next to you business. This is just God's business. This isn't a salvation message, but it does require a hand to be raised. And this is what I'm gonna ask you. So everyone just be respectful, close your eyes, bow your head, because this is just for other people right here. Um, if you are currently going through it and you are in desperate need to turn your desperation into determination, I just want you to slip your hand up right now and put it right back down. That's all you gotta do. Hands are going up all over the place, guys. Hands are going up all over the place. Listen, you can put your hands down. Listen, um, when I dismiss here in prayer, if you are ready to link arms with someone who can pray with you, I want you to feel free to come up here. And if you just need to sit and listen to the lyrics of this song called Victory that we're gonna play as, as we dismiss, then just sit here and worship God and cry out to him saying, I want my desperation to turn into determination because I know that I'm gonna get through it. Listen, you have to have that dogmatic type feel just like I had to experience. I'm at the end of my rope and I'm like, God, I am through with it. I don't know what I can do anymore. Listen, I'm here to challenge you and encourage you this morning. Don't stop fighting for your freedom and your victory through this. It has nothing to do with what you can do. It has everything to do with what Christ has already done, but it does require a part on your end to where you align your heart and your faith with what God has already been doing. And I promise you, friends, he's gonna pull you out of your it. How soon? I don't know. How? I don't know. But if you're thinking about it, you can't stop. Don't commit suicide. Do not get a divorce. Do not give up on your family or your children. Do not quit your job. You are gonna get through it. And I know you might, be through, you might not be through it right now, but God is still with you. He's never left you and he never will. So God, I just thank you right now for every person in this room, every family represented. God, for those who have come out of their it and everything is great right now, Lord, thank you for your victory and deliverance of their lives, of, of things that they walk through. But Lord, for every person who right now raised their hand and admitted, I am in it, I am going through it. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen their faith. Lord, where faith has been depleted, may you re-energize their faith. God, where intimacy with you has been lost, would you reignite that flame of passion and love in their hearts to where all they can focus on is not their it, but you. Lord, I thank you for the victory in our lives as your people, as your children, so that we can also link arms with others to help them pray for victory over their lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. King's House, I love you. If you need prayer, come on up here. We're gonna play a song called Victory. If not, I just ask that you be respectful as you leave for those who are gonna just worship God to this song for the next few moments.